So resuming our morning presentation, we have Boja Ogado, and the title of his presentation is A 3D Reconstruction of Pulmonary Air Sac System of the Ion Graded Tropeognatus Mesembrinos. Thank you, Rafael. Good morning, everybody. And as Rafael said, I'm going to introduce you to uh, this work of my, was part of my PhD. And it's about a three reconstruction of the pulmonary air sac. And uh, the air sac system uh, is a question on related to and a post coronal uh, skeletal pneumocytoma that is going uh, uh, one of the great issues, questions, uh, to understand pterosaur paleobiology. In this sense, uh, we take the largest uh, Brazilian pterosaur, so one of the largest pterosaurs, is Tropeognatus methembrius. And I would like to, to start, first of all, uh, I would like to recall for some striking words of one of the fathers of the Chorosur research, one of the, of the British paleontologists that at the end, at the edge of the uh, 19th century to 20th century, he stated the, the first uh, conceptions on what is a postcranial skeletal pneumaticity, what relevance has to understand the uh, paleobiology. Well, uh, reading the statement, he said, uh, there is no structure in the animal kingdom more distinctive of a class of animals that are cells perforated in the limb bones. They are connected with a peculiar kind of lung and earth, those of the bird. For in this close, the bronchial tubes open the other surface of the lungs into air cells, which are prolonged throughout the body into the bones. That anatomical concept, just talking about uh, birds, was very interesting uh, because the, the pulmonary system in birds are very peculiar uh, in comparison with other um, amniotes, with other vertebrates. Yeah, in this sense, he also said, it cannot be inferred that a reptile with wings, with referring to the pterosaur, uh, will develop ursus like those of a bird. In the first place, because those mammals which have wings don't develop ursus. He was talking about bots. The chiropterans has no postcranial skeletal pneumaticity, and, uh, and they don't have this, this, this kind of a structure in their bones. Uh, but they are uh, active flyers. They are uh, they are uh, one of the three lineage in uh, in vertebrates that achieve uh, power flight, right? But these structures could be related in uh, in uh, pterosaurs with birds, with eastern birds. And uh, he finished talking about therefore there being a peculiar avian structure with only exists in association with the avian heart and lung, it follows what, because the pterodactyl has the pneumatic foramina, it also has the structure, which they are the evidence, this lung and earth form of the birth clone. So he was related, this structure that we don't know how, how pterosaurs uh, live, how are the private life, of pterosaurs because they are extinct from more than 66 uh, million years ago. But we know about, about birds. So that point uh, was, inter was very important to relate uh, those groups. And he told uh, that, he wrote that in 1870, so more than a century ago, and he uh, put the basis to understand this kind of concepts on pterosaur anatomy, and that is the basis of this study. 
But first off, what is I I will I just start to talk. Whoa, uh, skeletal pneumaticity, blah blah blah. What does it mean, skeletal pneumaticity? Well, basically, it's the presence of earth space between the bones, and we have uh, pneumatic bones in our skull. We have paranasal pneumatic space and paratympanic pneumatic space, also in uh, in mammals, also in crocodiles, but pulmonary pneumaticity, the postcranial one, is exclusive within the extant vertebrae in birds. So uh, that is very interesting uh, to understand that although air field or the presence of air spares in bones is not related with, uh, 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 with concrete structures, as the pulmonary and the heart sacs. So postcranial skeletal pneumaticity. Uh, we have an example of uh, several uh, bones, uh, femoral or, or, or birds, and uh, comparison this drawing of uh, the inner structure of a uh, bird bone and a mammal bone uh, you could see, well, uh, inside uh, uh, for the cortical bone, you could see in the in the beard one, you have the trabeculae, very characteristic as standpipes. But in uh, in mammal, you have the marrow, the bone marrow that is very characteristic at is almost absent in uh, birds. Birds, uh, talking about how respiratory system works in birds, birds uh, have a uh, system of earth sac uh, in their ventilation system. And uh, the earth sac works to produce an uh, unidirectional flow uh, where air enters and exits. Uh, the lung at the same rate, contrasting the lungs of other uh, vertebrates, such as uh, mammals, where air enters and exits in the lung as a tidal, tidal ventilation. But take a definition of air cirque. Uh, we have two, a uh, simple one, any air reservoir in an animal with epithelium line and they avoid the parenchymal tissue. Uh, as we could see in the following slices, is, uh, it could imply other structures that derive from the uh, RSAC or proper, the RSAC properly. And we could take the uh, second one as auxiliary structures of the birth respiratory system origina uh, originated from the secondary bronchi, being connected to the lungs and connected to some pneumatic bones through pneumatic diverticula. This is important because this definition of pneumatic diverticula could be applied of dot that this pneumatic diverticula invade this pneumatic bone. Here we have the uh, in a in a buzzard, in an extant buzzard, uh, the air sac system with the the main uh, thorax. Uh, yeah, an abdominal air sacs. This green one are the lungs, but also the cervical, the cervical uh, uh, sac. And uh, how uh, from the air sac derive the pneuma uh, the pneumatic diverticula the structures perforate in the bone. And how we know about that? This uh, well in the in the other picture and this one. We could see that the studies uh, for understand for understand the um, the pneumaticity is as in extant birds is essential. Uh, one method, one interesting method, is to uh, fill the the air sacs. Here is filled with latex, and we could see that even in birds uh, where they have pneumatic humery, uh, the, the bone is filled. And well, 
this is structure that could we see here, uh, well, this is a duck, but ostrich or hornbill or a goose uh, has also a, a pneumatic foramina in their vertebrae and uh, even uh, the, uh, the appendicular bones. And at that point, uh, we could see that this, these particular uh, features as pneumatic foramina are where they are filled. But pneumatic diverticula, as I told you before, we could, we could uh, say that the definition, the uh, sensula to definition of, of fire strike is extensive to pneumatic diverticulum that it could est uh, uh, strangely related to air space, as air space is an air field bone space occupied by pneumatic diverticulum. And uh, in this process called pneumatization. Well, we could see here that the, uh, this is a ostrich, and how uh, the air sacs as pneumatic diverticula bore the bone uh, under the, the, the muscles and uh, penetrates in, the, in this cervical vertebrae as on all the neck. And uh, well, this, as I say, uh, concept of space is important when we're talking about fossils because it, uh, it allows to infer the presence of diverticula when fossa or foramina are excavated in the bone. So we have only the bone, but we could infer that. And for a study, the uh, postcranial skeletal pneumaticity in fossil taxa is based in those inference. Well, so which lin lineage has a skeletal pneumaticity? If we're talking about amniotes, in external amniotes, as I told you in red, where uh, those we present exclusive cranial, but post-cranial just in birth. But when we are talking about fossil uh, lineage, and in, uh, in those lineage uh, are more than, are just inferred. We have also non-avian dinosaurs, as uh, non-avian theropods or sauropodomorphs, and pterosaurs, as uh, Harry Seeley wha was the first to appoint that. And uh, well, knowing that we could infer uh, on the presence of pneumatic uh, foramina, uh, the uh, structure where the bone is bored is as we could uh, reconstruct, the, uh, we could infer and reconstruct how the our system, pulmonary ARSAC system is. And uh, the first one to do that, uh, that case were in this paper of Clayson et al. in 2009, uh, that they provide a framework of pterosaurian respiratory system. In this sense, uh, they took an example uh, in Nanyang World, and, and they use as a proxy to explore the distribution of postcranial skeletal pneumaticity uh, in pterosaurs. Uh, well, they differ from previous uh, uh, versions that state that morphology of the trunk in pterosaurs was uh, deeper in the posterior external region, and therefore, this region will lead to further uh, displacement during lung ventilation. Well, uh, because of the longer moment and arm of caudal external ribs. In addition, these authors uh, also suggest that there is a partitioned uh, pulmonary system similar that occurs in exome birds. Uh, in the sense, it was based as in respiratory anatomy in extreme non avian theropods, based on patterns of postcranial skeletal pneumaticity. Also, Clayson's et al. 2009 uh, suggests that in at least some of the larger pterodactyloids, again, this Anyanguero, uh, 
talking about appendicular uh, limb bones, uh, appendicular pneumaticity, it will be present as some kind of subcutaneous diverticular network. Uh, it will stem from the, what they call um, interclavicular, interclavicular sac to the most distal wing uh, skeletal element from the, in the case of the forelimb from the wing. Well, uh, this point, uh, such interpretation was based on the presence of pneumatic foraminum in the distal elements, as in the, in the wing phalanxes, in the manual phalanxes, uh, just in this uh, lineage of large pterodactyloids, as well as the base of putative subdermal tissue coming from well-preserved portion of, of wing membrane that was later reinterpreted as, as part of the, of the of the body, but anyway, uh, they take the analogy of an extant example. Uh, in this case, the the case of, of large body birds, as vultures, as pelicans, and they present this kind of subcutaneous diverticular network. Well, perhaps. One of the most interesting features of the reconstruction of such appendicular uh, diverticular network uh, in, in this young world is a, a kind of a sleeve. This, uh, this kind of a sleeve could cover all the wing bones. Uh, well, here you see uh, in the image first of the, of the right, of the left, sorry. And uh, the confining such network in the preaxial margin of the of the wing, with the left, the, with the right one, uh, recreates a putative, expansive, uh, maximal size of the subcutaneous diverticular network as a huge floater uh, for its enclosure within the dorsal and ventral layers of the of the wing membrane. In the same vein, with on 2013, uh, display a similar distribution of the appendicular network as a, such a sleeve covering the bones. Nevertheless, his interpretative uh, scheme of such a particular uh, with regard to the wing membrane is very, very insightful. So in ho how, how the pneumatic diverticulum may fat inside the bone. Even so, uh, he doesn't represent the, uh, the, these stand pipes that are the, uh, here in the, in the modified version that are the trabeculi. And in the base of, of this kind of, of literature, we do the, our study on the basis of extant uh, birds uh, where they bore an uh, also following in uh, using phylo phylogenetic bracket in the case of Anyanguera to Tropeognathus, using a software, uh, Terobier, who attended in 2018 to the symposium, perhaps remember, that we present there the, the Tropeognathus recreation with different layers of uh, mus uh, skeletal, muscular, and uh, with the skin, and it was the basis to add a new layer that you could see here, as the through the reconstruction of the pulmonary arsic system, and displaying a putative distribution that you, uh, that you could see colored in green, whilst the base color is about the trachea. Uh, well, we include uh, the main pulmonary system. Uh, no, we not include the the cranial uh, the cranial pneumaticity. And uh, well, as you could see, inferring in the the bones of the wings that it achieve bones as steroids or even the the manual phalanges. Well, getting details of the simulation of the pulmonary system, it is displayed 
over the trachea or either side of the cervical series. Few. And uh, a pair of symmetrical cervical arches which penetrate into the cervical vertebrae. And uh, well, the pairs of thoracic and abdominal arches, you could see here, uh, uh, they are uh, uh, underneath the lungs and abdominal caudoventrally. And uh, beneath the cervical arches are connected to them, but cranially to the lungs and disposed to the, in interesca uh, to the interescapurocolacoidal arsac. This one. And a sizable arsac, which might be the key for the diversification of the diverticular arsacs to the wing and appendicular uh, diverticulum. From this air sac uh, arise both scapulocoracoid uh, and humeral air sacs, whose diverticula penetrate into the cavity of the humerus, as you could see here and here. Uh, spreading out between the trabeculae, uh, inside the bone, the trabeculae are disposed and a super assembly from one side to the other side of the thin wall, giving and support to the skeletal element. And well, in summary, although reconstructing the uh, unpreserved pulmonary air sac system of an extinct pterosaur might resemble a subjective approach, there are many information obtained by inference throughout postcranial post skeletal pneumatite. This is the basis for our proposal. Well, it's interest, interesting. The proposed interscapura coracoid RSAC is based in the inter interclavicular, widely distributing extant birds. It should be taken into account that Grayson's uh, uh, at all 2009 referred a purported inter interclavicular RSAC. It will be present in pterosaurs, not in the different structure of the flying apparatus of the between pterosaurs and birds. And finally, the third 3D reconstruction of the purple pulmonary air sac system of intrapregnatus, a new model for approaching a comprehensive outlook of searching for structures with place and artistic visual role, but also the study outline for future works. Advances in understanding of inner structure of pterosaur postcranial remains. Uh, elements as well as extant birds will predetermine more accurately how the respiratory system of pterosaurs was. Um, thank you so much. Muito obrigado. And if you have any question. Questions? 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 Okay, thank you very much, Bojo. <laughs> what was the main pro problem to your research? I know it, but it, I think it's interesting that the young people know about it. So, what was the main issue? What was the main problem to develop that kind of research? Uh, about my research on nematis. Yeah, yes, how to scan a large, a, a large bone in a micro CT to understand how uh, they evolve or how the trabeculae are distributed. So we need a scan. If, if you have a, a, a huge uh, micro CT or they exist, it could be uh, helpful to understand our, uh, our outlook about how this uh, these bones are uh, in the inner structure. Anyone Is it okay, else? Alex? Lucas. Maybe you already said that, but I, I'd like to try to ask this. How long does it take to make the entire simulation of a structure like that size? And if you reduce the scale of what you're looking at, does it take less time? Yeah, the point is the... Like the computer building, I'm, I'm asking it. Yeah, but 
I mean, uh, also, also, I could do that. First of all, I don't know if uh, uh, M&M's the material method support. So briefly, that we we do we don't that because we have previous work on a trop uh, reconstructed uh, tropionatus that it facilitate. Yeah, we don't have to do that in a, in a, in all on with all the work. But of course, all the details uh, about uh, ports, how. Uh, how they board and the relations in with uh, pneumatic foramina or how they could distribute the, the, the air sacs, the air sac system is, is a challenge. Uh, but we could infer some, just the most that we have more knowledge is about uh, how pneumatic diverticular board. So this kind of detail are essential to, to understand how could they distribute in their wings. I don't know if I... How long? How long? Take it. Yeah, yeah I mean. <laughs> uh, this part, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, this is, a, this is a, an accumulation of different data and inferring, also using phylo phylogenetic bracketing. As we know, tero, uh, pterosaurologists, Tropionatus is known by the in the holotype by a current, by, by the school, and we are talking, uh, we are taking this about the Anyanguera or the blah, 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 months of works and months of works of um, or years of uh, more than a year in the case of um, in the case of the the simulation of the Tropionatus with the with the Original project, not with these layers, these, these new layers. But okay, uh, the point is the 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 how to how to do that the reconstruction. It was just the how do you say Cereja do Bolo, the uh, the cherry on top in the in the in the in the cake. <laughs> to do that because the main word was works in, in birds and uh, how they bore in pterosaurs or in this kind of pterosaurs because they are different uh, de depending on the lineage and later using Sabros uh, and another uh, uh, software uh, with the help of uh, Hugo Salais uh, we could uh, we could uh, recreate that so yeah it, it was uh, time but also the time to achieve how we could uh, formulate that. Juliana. Nice work, Borja. Thank uh, you. I, I have been in your uh, PhD. <laughs> so so, so I, I, l I know a little bit more about the work and I'm a, a huge fan. I have one question. I don't know if you mentioned, I didn't get it, but which specimen do you use for for your research, the, 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 the specimen you scan, the post screening of Tropiognatus, which specimen is? Floral material for Yeah, but and anyway, uh, we have the phylogenetic bracketing because mm -hmm. we have now uh, a Tropiognatus, uh, a, com a more or less complete uh, Tropiognatus. We are based in Anyanguera Piscata. Okay. Take on that, well, we have two Tropiognatus, uh, one that we know Burning, you, you yeah. work in. The largest guy, the largest chap, that the largest chap that uh, it was. That's the basis, most part of the basis, uh, due to the postcranial skeleton of the uh, dust of the uh, National Museum. Yeah, because we lost this one in the fire. So, ah, yeah. If if you had used it, uh, scan it, this will be the basically the only information we had from this specimen at all because we lose it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. So our next presenter is Richard Buchner. Uh, the tension distribution in response to muscular loads in the neck of Ianguera piscatae, Pterodactyloida Ianguerida.
Hello, hello everyone. Okay, um, I'm Richard Buchmann. <laughs> uh, I'm today. Uh, I I'll, I'll talk about the tension distribution in response to muscular loads in the neck of Ianguera piscato. Uh, I'm I'm uh, I did this this study with uh, Thais Rodriguez, and let's get it started. Uh, firstly, a brief introduction of the neck of dorsars. Uh, the cervical vertebrae, okay. The cervical vertebrae vary in size and shape from the neck. Uh, how you can see the mid cervical vertebrae and uh, posterior cervical vertebrae, the other way, atlas axis, uh, are different shapes and uh, length and height. Uh, therefore, the muscles also vary in size and shape, which consequently change the load produced by them during the movement. Um, the dorsiflexion or ventral flexion, um, lateral incursion. And here, we investigate the relationship between the movements performed by muscles in the most resistant areas of terrestrial cervical uh, vertebrae. Uh, in this study, we use the fourth, and this one, seventh, this one, and eighth vertebrae of the cervical series of holotype of Anguera uh, a Brazilian pterosaur but housed in Japan. Uh, and the choice was due to the three-dimensional preservation of the vertebral elements. We 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 did see the scans, okay. Uh, the loads used were inferred from muscle reconstruction previous load performed during my PhD. Uh, loads were quantified through the maximum possible force production, the FP max. And we found we found the FP max uh, by the multiplication between thickness of the each muscle and uh, muscle stress. Uh, we assign in here the muscle stress in 25 newton by each muscle, uh, and the thickness we found uh, uh, by the proportion of the insertion and uh, origin area. And this table shows the FP max of each vertebra for each muscle. Uh, sorry, uh, this one uh, because uh, no values because this is short muscles, just uh, the first half of the neck. Uh, and the analysis. Um, I prepared of the mesh uh, in softer hyper mesh. We assigned these properties for the bone, uh, 22 gigapascal for Youngos models, and Poisson ratio equal to 0 0.3. And finally, uh, we did uh, a finite ele element analysis via in softer abacus. And posteriorly, uh, the real results, uh, von Mises average, uh, that represented the tension of the uh, each muscle uh, exerted in each cortex vertebra. And this is the, the mesh. Uh, my results. Um, the analysis indicates that the vertebra closest to the base uh, of the neck were most affected by the tension generated by muscle loads. Uh, you can see here the difference uh, in the fourth vertebra, the gradient in the fourth vertebra, and seventh and eighth. And the same uh, limit uh, was up for the three models. Uh, and it's uh, the uh, example for the uh, forces. Uh, due to the large muscle load concentrated in this region, in the uh, near the, the base of the neck. Uh, 
this table shows the results uh, of the von Mises average all of the results uh, from the in each for each muscles in each vertebra. Um, and the highest von Mises average were attributed to loads originate from muscles that perform those sort of ventral movements uh, for transversal spinalis capitis, transversal uh, spinalis cervix, and complexus muscles, uh, muscles arranged dorsally to the uh, cervical series, uh, principally in fourth vertebra and seventh vertebra. And rectus capitis ventralis in longus colis, uh, muscles arranged uh, in ventral, uh, in, in, in principle, in here, in eighth vertebra. And these are the gradients of the these results. Uh, the highest severates were presented by tension resulting from muscles arranged dorsally in mid cervical vertebra, the complex muscle and uh, transversal spinalis services, while in the eighty vertebra, the highest average associated with uh, muscle disposed ventrally, uh, longest called muscles. Okay, considering the movement performance, uh, dorsiflexion generated greater tension than ventral flexion on the vertebrae along the neck. Uh, you can see in this table, uh, dorsiflexion movement and ventral flexion movement, the difference. Consequently, the stress of more concentration in the bias of the zygapophysis, this area, here and here. Uh, pedicle, this area, here and here. And dorsal surface of the vertebra, here and the narrow spine. Suggesting the presence of the articular ligaments uh, in the joints, here, uh, like uh, uh, ligamento collateralis. Uh, and ligaments are raised dorsally of the neck, uh, like uh, supersegmental uh, ligaments, like uh, ligamento elastico interlaminare, ligamento elastico interspinale, or ligamento nocai, né, or, uh, our ligamento flavum. Uh, and the vertebral condyle, uh, this area, uh, was not region, uh, much affected by the tension generated by the muscular loads. After all, uh, the center received loads directly uh, in response to the ventral flexion, uh, uh, this movement, indicating a right level of resistance to probably mechanical shocks received in this joint region by the, the natural movement. Th this is the same table, but uh, this is the lowest of von Mises uh, average. Uh, in the lowest von Mises average, we are attributed to loads of muscles placed laterally in the cranial half of the neck, like uh, intertransversary muscles and flexor collie muscles, and uh, muscles with a function of a cervical stabilization and joint flexibility in the caudal half of the neck, uh, like uh, interspinalis uh, muscle, uh, segmental muscle, right, and intercostal muscle. Uh, even low concentration of the tension on the lateral surface uh, and the uh, mid cervical vertebra, this area, indicates that uh, a structural resistance to wide lateral incursions of the neck uh, and the, the lateral stability uh, also agrees with the hypothesis that the pneumatic foramen is located at structurally rigid sites on the vertebral surface. Uh, the pneumatic foramen is here, in here. Uh, the tension was concentrated laterally on eight vertebrae, which confirms less lateral mobility than the observed in um, mid cervical vertebrae. And there are the presence of the smaller uh, lateral pneumatic foramina here, oops, here, than those seen in mid cervical vertebra, this area, right? So, Finally, my conclusions, the narrow arcs of our vertebrae are the sites that receive the most tension in the cortex. Uh, look at the difference here in the 40 and the uh, 70 in the posterior cervical vertebrae. 
indicating the presence of the robust cervical ligaments arranged dorsally to the cervical series. Uh, that uh, example of uh, segment ligaments here, uh, ligamentological interspinalis, or ligamento flavum here, or um, maybe ligamento lucai. And uh, the central is structurally stronger than uh, the mid cervical vert, oh, than and the narrow arc. Uh, the ventral condyle was practically not affected by muscle loads. Uh, you can see this. Uh, the response of the lateral face of the mid cervical vertebra to the submit loads indicate an excellent level of resistance. Uh, indicating a good response to lateral flexion and torsion in this vertebra and confirming the hypothesis of the, the presence of the pneumatic foramen uh, only in structural rigid places on the bone surface. But the same region, uh, it's apparently not structurally unstable and aged vertebra. And I think that is it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much, Richard. Um, does anyone have any questions? Joseph. Um, so with the, the more structural strength in the lower part of the neck, yeah. would that be, can you assume that that would be part of a launch? So um, that part of the neck would be stronger or... Is there, would that be for feeding, or why would that evolve that strength there? I, I didn't this test. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, this is a preliminary results, but uh, I, I think I think that uh, b by the movement of the dorsiflexion. Right, uh, this test uh, uh, shows a um, limit of the power, uh, power of the, the neck, right? Not, uh, I, I, I don't confirm it. We, the pterosaur present this, this movement in the maximum force. Cool, good talk. Yeah, I, I think that's an excellent question um, because uh, all these uh, models are predicted on movement, and of course, they could move the necks in several instances, not only when launching, but perhaps feeding on the ground as well, why not? Mm -hmm. So they might do something like this, but um, these would require more modeling like of the whole movement, mm -hmm. and not only, uh, well, because this is based only on muscles and bones. So that would require some, well, this should be, the essential part before going to the further questions, like movements themselves, which is still really not that explored for pterosaurs, especially the neck, because most people will only, well, we will see this later today, but a lot of work has been done on locomotion, not necessarily on the other parts of the body that's, in, you know, they are evolved, uh, evolved in the locomotion themselves, like they are not only wings and legs, right? So it has been very little known this, but this is an excellent hypothesis and I really appreciate it, yeah. I think it's a pity that Mike's not here because he would be very excited about this idea and the hypothesis that could be tested, yeah. It was really interesting to see how much stronger further down in the series you got so that that's, I could see a lot of stress when you're in that kind of movement. Yeah, very cool. Thanks. Anyone else? I think that's it. So I'd like to announce some changes in our schedule today. Uh, so the poster section Instead of 1.30, uh, we're gonna start at 2 p.m. And Fabiana's lecture, um, instead of 4.30, it's gonna be at 4 p.m. So we gain 30 minutes, okay? So now we have our lunch break, and let's see, because I'm hungry. <laughs> okay.